I met Darren Tang in 2018 when I was the director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and he was the chief executive of the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. When he was the head of the Singapore IP office, he led the development of a national IP strategy in Singapore, and under his watch, Singapore was ranked number one in the world when it comes to the patent system, according to the United States Chamber of Commerce. Think about that, a small country, five and a half million people, ranked number one in patents. The vision was unmistakable. Since then, in 2020, Darren Tang was elected to be the Director General of the, um, of, of the uh, World IP Organization, WIPO. WIPO is a United Nations organization. It's one of the specialized agencies that focuses on intellectual property. And he has been leading the, that office since then. He took office in the middle of the pandemic. In fact, the election was in March of 2020, and I was there with him and many other leaders around the world. And when we came back to the United States, the pandemic began right away. But let me assure you, there is no relationship. Between 1997 and 2012, before he joined the IP office, Darren Tang held different legal positions within the attorneys uh, general's chambers and the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore. In 2016, in recognition of his visionary leadership, he received the Public Administration Medal from the Prime Minister's Office in Singapore for outstanding efficiency and competence in the service of his country. Darren Tang also is a graduate of the National University of Singapore, but in addition, he has an LLM, a Master's of Laws, from the Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C. Darren understands the role that intellectual property has in driving innovation, personal development, equal access to opportunity, economic growth, and the betterment of the human condition. And you heard some of these same things from Dr. Burla. Both these leaders understand the inextricable link between a strong, reliable, predictable intellectual property system and a strong, robust innovation economy. Darren is a dynamic leader, a visionary, and a breath of fresh air for the United Nations system and multilateralism. It was an honor for Los Angeles to have him come here and spend the whole week in our community, which he did and met with many, many people and groups. And it is my honor to welcome my friend, Darren Tang, to the LA Best stage now for his keynote address. Thank you so much, Andre, for that very, very warm welcome. Um, I, I noticed a few speakers sharing their UCLA street cred. I, I can't attest to that, having you know spent time at Georgetown and more on the East Coast. But my daughter is applying to the Masters of Education at UCLA. So that's my, that's my attempt to claim to be part of the UCLA family. But it's such a great pleasure to be here. Um, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and Andre, thank you not just for that wonderful introduction, but for your continued passion in strengthening the IP system, not just in the US, but around the world as well. When Andre spoke at LA Best last year, I think he offered a very energetic defense of IP. And I think Albert alluded to that a little bit as well, talking about the challenges that we face in the IP and innovation ecosystem. So I want to use my time today to reinforce that message and to show how IP is not just relevant to California, to the US and other developed countries, but to everyone, everywhere. And last year, Andre started by posing a very simple question. Human invention has existed since time immemorial, and I think Regent Park said that it's part of the human condition. We are curious and inventive by nature, and yet innovation, the process by which an idea becomes a product or service which creates, how it creates impact, real impact, 
only really gathered pace a few hundred years ago. So how do we explain this? I would argue that one of the key factors has been the rise of the modern IP system, an ingredient that, to use President Lincoln's famous words, added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. And we saw the system in action during the pandemic. And of course, Albert has laid it out quite a bit. When technologies that have been incentivized by IP over decades, mRNA, as you know, as something that's been around for quite some time, but new applications of these technologies emerge at warp speed. And throughout all these, IP has served as a mechanism for collaboration, partnership, and deployment of these technologies around the world. As the UN agency for IP, WIPO has a rich source of data, global eye on what happens around the world. And so we published a pattern landscape report on the pandemic last year, and three findings stand out. First, scale. Nearly 8,000 pattern applications were filed for COVID vaccines and therapeutics and protective equipment across almost 50 patent offices between January 2020 and September last year. Now, to put this in context, it took 70 years, 70 years, 1941 to 2011, for around just 500 patent families relating to influenza vaccines to emerge. Second, novelty. Despite the speed of the response, we saw new approaches to treatment that were catalyzed by the desire to address the pandemic. These include the use of CRISPR-Cas technology to target viral genes and engineered exosomes as delivery vehicles. And third, breadth. Patent applications were evenly distributed between private companies on the one hand and universities and research institutions on the other hand, which would be very interesting to the UC system. And this was true not just in the US, but across the whole ecosystem, which meant that there was a whole of system approach and response to the gravest human emergency for a century. Of course, while we can be grateful for these times, we know that the next time we have to do better. Vaccine distribution was inequitable, with many countries receiving none. And while the World Health Organization has declared that COVID is no longer a global health emergency, we know that it's only a matter of time before the next pandemic. So we need the capacity to work together as a team, as a community, to act more effectively and move even faster than we did, particularly when it comes to manufacturing and distributing vaccines and other treatments to all parts of the world. And so to put it simply, we need an IP ecosystem that works for all. And so how do we get there? Before turning to the present, I want to look to the past a bit and to share a story that many of you will be familiar with, the story of Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer. And it's now just over 50 years since Boyer of UC San Francisco and Cohen from Stanford met at a Hawaiian deli and over pastrami and corned beef san sandwiches laid the foundations for gene therapy and the birth of biotech. Within just four months, they had combined their skills to create a new method of engineering and manufacturing genes. But one possibility hadn't occurred to either scientist, intellectual property. Enter News Rymers, an engineer by training. Rymers built his career at direct, in directing contracts at tech companies, and by the late 1960s was at Stanford determined to overhaul the university's approach to research com commercialization. Opening the newspaper one day, he came across a feature on Cohen and Boyer's work and immediately sprang into action telephoning Cohen to encourage a patent application. The response was lukewarm. In Cohen's words, and I quote, we are not dream of the notion of patenting any of this. It sounds crazy. But what is undeniable is that without that phone call, history would have been different, not just for Stanford and the UC system, but for millions of people around the world. And ultimately, Cohen and Boyce technology was licensed to 500 companies, 500, over the duration of the patents including some of the businesses represented here today. Uh, and all, these, all this work supported the development of nearly 2,500 new treatments, including life-saving drugs for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and HIV. And history would also have been different had an investor in his late 20s named Robert Swanson had not been fascinated by the potential of DNA, RDNA. Sensing the opportunity, he decided to work his way through the phone book co-calling scientists researching the area. Boyer was the first person who agreed to meet him. And what was scheduled as a 10-minute meeting turned into a three-hour brainstorming session, which, as these stories always seem to do, relocated to a nearby bar. By the time it came to settle the bill, each had agreed to put up $500 
to cover the legal fees to set up a new company. And that company became Genentech, which today employs 13,000 people around the world and saves lives through its technology. I tell this story for a couple of reasons. First, because of its foundational importance to the development of biotech industry, an industry now worth $1.5 trillion. Many of you in the room are part of the industry, employs over 2 million people in the US alone, and is one of the great engines, not just of innovation, but of human advancement. Second, because it underscores the critical role of IP in translating science to impact, and the necessity of taking an ecosystems approach to tech transfer and research commercialization. But perhaps I also tell this story because of how serendipitous it was. What if those phone calls, those phone books, pastrami sandwiches and bar hopping did not happen? Before contact from Rymers, Cohen and Boyne had not considered protecting their discovery at all through the IP system. And, if, and indeed, they were skeptical about the need to patent. In the end, they filed the application only a week before the dreaded 12-month deadline kicked in. So it'd be nice to think that these days are over, that serendipity has become strategy and that people value IP protection. But while it's certainly true that IP and innovation ecosystems have matured immensely in the past 50 years, here in the US and many other countries as well, it's still too often just an afterthought rather than a powerful catalyst to help make a great idea become reality. Even in Europe, where the modern IP ecosystem was born 150 years ago, a survey in 2021 showed that only 9% of small and medium enterprises have registered IP rights, despite the fact that SMEs that have registered an IP right have almost 70% more revenue per employee than those that don't. So we have to start being better at this journey of using IP as a force for good, but raising the awareness of the importance of IP to those innovating and creating on the ground. We need to make IP more relatable, understandable, and impactful, not just to lawyers and specialists and experts, but to business owners, entrepreneurs, startups, designers, inventors, scientists, and others who are at the forefront of finding new ideas and new ways of doing things. The motto of UCLA is, let there be light. And I believe that now we have a real opportunity to move IP out of the shadows and into the light and show how it's not just a legal right, but a powerful catalyst for jobs, investments, business growth, and ultimately for economic and social development, as well as a, as well as a way for us to address global challenges like climate change. And let me share three reasons why. One, in today's global economy, IP and other intangible assets like data, know-how, expertise, trade secrets, are driving growth and constituting the economy in a way that is unprecedented. In the US, close to 90% of the value of the S&P 500 is now in the form of intangible assets, with a total estimated value of over 70 trillion US dollars, 70 trillion, which is more than the world's largest economies combined. Two, there's growing evidence that we are on the cusp of a new wave in deep tech innovation that will traverse the digital and physical worlds. Albert spoke a lot about how the strategy of, of his company is connected to digitalization, and, and all of that, and I'm sure that's the same story in many of our companies as well. WIPO data shows that one in three inventions now relates to digital tech, including AI, big data, and the Internet of Things, with digital-related innovations growing 170% faster than all other patent categories in the last five years. And three, IP is globalizing and globalizing fast. Today, close to eight in 10 IP filings come from Asia, Africa and Latin America, up from 5 in 10 just 10 years ago. One example is India. Until 2006, India filed fewer than 100,000 trademark applications, but now this figure stands close to half a million, with India the fourth largest trademark filer in the world, just behind China, US and the EU. Faced by these fundamental changes in the global IP and innovation landscape, the work of WIPO and we in the IP community cannot be business as usual. Instead, we must transform what IP and innovation means to people in all parts of the world. And that's why we are building, to build, we are building a more inclusive IP ecosystem. One that engages, as I said earlier, not just with experts and professionals, but women, youth, entrepreneurs, startups, SMEs, researchers, even indigenous peoples and communities, all of whom have been underserved by IP in the past. This is not a revolution, but an evolution. One designed to bring IP to the 99% of people out there so that more people can see its value that many in this room already see. 
Much of this work is centered on the delivery of impact-driven projects on the ground. And since the current WIPO administration started its term over two years ago, and Andre, I still remember that crazy time that we were campaigning and doing all of that in, the, in 2020. But since we started from two years ago, we have begun over 90 projects in all corners of the globe, with a particular focus on supporting women, youth and SMEs. We have introduced flagship programs for women entrepreneurs and innovators in countries as diverse as Peru, Chile, Jordan, Egypt, Namibia, Uganda, Ethiopia. Support doesn't mean a two-day seminar or three-day workshop, but a six to ninth, nine-month mentor, mentorship program to help the participants incorporate IP into their business strategy, into their lives, so that they can use IP to create jobs for the community and let them see and let others in the community see how IP and intangible assets are part of their journey as well. The WIPO Academy, already the world's largest provider of IP training and skills, now offers over 300 courses that reach more than 270,000 people over the last two years, nearly, nearly three courses of whom are from Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Of the 270,000 trained, by the way, over 40,000 were small and medium business enterprise owners. WIPO has also helped to build technology innovation support centers, or TIS, in close to 100 countries. Now, these are proto tax transfer offices, so I want to say that they hopefully in time they'll grow to become like what the TG does for the California system. And this network grew by a further 10% last year to almost 1,500 with 90 TIS networks operational around the world. We also created tools like the WIPO Diagnostics tool for SMEs, which is a tool to allow business owners to understand what part of their business strategy is connected to the IP through a 15-20 minute survey uh, written in business language. It has been accessed more than 12,000 times since its launch last year and generated 2,000 customized reports for SME owners around the world. And of course, we want to highlight the rising use of WIPO's international registries, which has averaged a growth of 30% over the past five years, and the continued use of our dispute resolution services with cases quadrupling over the same period. So the work of all of these, work of all of this is to is for IP to serve as a powerful enabler for everyone with a great idea from anywhere to be able to bring their idea to the market. And even in mature ecosystems like the US, we want this to happen. Because awareness of use of IP is not even in this country, with IP intensive, intensive industries heavily concentrated in New England, this part of the world, and of course the upper, and, and, and the upper Midwest. So the question I have is, how can we in this room, how can we in this community work together to ensure that IP creates impact for all? Let me suggest three areas for action. First, let us make sure that IP is seen as an enabler and not as an obstacle to the work of creating a better, fairer, and more sustainable work, world. To, this, to do this, we need to make sure that IP is able to deliver concrete and tangible results that lift up people, businesses, and communities around the world. So next week after this, my time in California, I'm flying on to Lisbon and we are hosting a major conference with the Portuguese government on IP and the UN Sustainable Development Goals a key theme of which will be on, on partnerships and how the global IP community can work together and others to put to use IP in the service of putting the SDGs back on track. But there's still a perception in some quarters that instead of acting as a bridge towards a fairer and better world, IP can be an obstacle towards this. To counter this, we need not just words and arguments, but actions and deeds. And I want to highlight, for example, the work of the Madsen's Patent Pool. The work of the MPP, has led to successes such as TLD, which has become the most widely used HIV regimen in the world, taken daily almost by almost 20 million people in over 100 countries. The licensing of IP to those that need it was also at the forefront of the pandemic response, with pharmaceutical firms signing over 140 agreements with partners around the world. These and many other voluntary arrangements and agreements which go beyond the licensing of IP to incorporating the sharing of technology and know-how create win-win approaches that build confidence in the global IP system and show how IP can deliver robust and sustainable outcomes for all. But more can and needs to be done here. And so I want to take this opportunity before this community to encourage and advocate for the industry to push even harder to find ways to license the IP that you worked so hard to create to those that need it around the world, especially those in developing countries and LDCs, and so that we can show the whole world in a concrete way, how IP can be a force for good. Second, building respect and love, 
not just for IP, but more fundamentally for innovation. Greater confidence in the IP system makes it easier to demystify and highlight its true value, especially amongst our youths who are our future leaders and decision makers. I believe that IP has become part of the basic toolkit of anyone seeking to bring an idea to the market. And yet, IP education is still lacking in the curriculum of many of our schools, and even in universities where it tends to be confined as an optional, mod optional module of law schools. This needs to change. While not everyone needs to become an IP professional, practical knowledge and the basic familiarity of IP is now becoming a fundamental part of not just a good education, but also a range of careers spanning business, academia, science, government, and the creative industries. IP needs to go beyond the law school into science, engineering, business, and tech schools. And I invite the UC system to show leadership by stepping up to do this. The WIPO Academy is likewise transforming our work. We have redesigned the courses offered by us to go beyond technical IP knowledge to practical IP skills. And we introduced courses like IP for startups, IP for exporters, IP for mobile app developers, IP for teachers of youth. Why do you want to do this? To help people to pick up the kind of practical IP skills that are becoming important to successful careers and catalyzing innovation. We also work with Harvard Law School to launch a course on IP in health called Pattern X that is for free and has already trained 500 people to look at IP issues relating to healthcare. And third, perhaps most importantly, is to bring IP to everyone everywhere. It is critical that IP is not seen as the exclusive preserve of IP experts, but as a tool that can be used by all. This isn't easy, but it is critical for the ability of the global IP community to connect our work with the world. Let's take, for example, the IP gender gap. Women make up half the world, but only 16% of the international patent applications filed before WIPO last year. And this is wrong and worrying for a number of reasons. It points to significant untapped innovation potential. It suggests the persistence of structural barriers within our IP and innovation ecosystem. And it highlights that women within the IP industries face various challenges still for, as part of their careers. So at WIPO, we're working with partners around the world to change this for the better. So I'm very pleased to be joined today by Lisa Jorgensen. Lisa, if you could stand up, please. She's WIPO's first female Deputy Director General of the Patents. <laughs> WIPO's first female direct, Deputy Director General of the Patents and Technology Sector. She's American, she's Texan. Um, and she's also WIPO's first IP and Gender Champion. Now, many of you will know Lisa well because she was the former executive director of IPLA, one of the big IP associations in the US. And so under her guidance, we have just published WIPO's first IP gap, IP gender action plan. Um, and one of the things I want to highlight is that we ran, when we ran the numbers, women's share of patent applications is higher in biotech than in any other sector. So you are taking the lead in this with women accounting for in the biotech sector, 30% of all patent applications compared to 10% in mechanical engineering, not wanting to shame mechanical engineering, but I think we, we are seeing biotech take the lead on this. But 30% is still a gap, and there's still a journey to travel. So I want to encourage the industry to tell this story, work with Lisa, and continue to take decisive action to fully balance up the skills. And WIPO will continue to find impactful ways of boosting gender equality across innovation and science, and we're committed to generating new data around the issue to encouraging a strong policy response at the national and regional levels, and to delivering impact-driven projects that support more women, innovators, and creators around the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, IP, which is a powerful catalyst for bringing ideas to the world, is critical to a work of building a better world. WIPO, as the UN Agency for IP, looks forward to working with the global IP community and with your community to write and build the future, chap future chapter of the global IP ecosystem so that it can be a force for good in the world and an enabler for the better, fairer, and more sustainable world that we all want to see for our children and their children. Thank you very much.